Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am not Tony Gerdeman. I am Tom Moore. Tony Gerdeman is not here today, but I am joined instead by Kevin Noon. Not like usual, but like sometimes when we do a live show. Kevin. How's it going? I really thought about trying to just jump into the power pause right at the beginning and say, that's that's Tony's gig. That's not your gig, but doing well. Glad to be here. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, Tony here soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, lots of things going on and uh, happy to be on the show. I thought about whether I wanted to do that or not. It's like, well, we kind of, it's tradition. We're kind of, we're kind of contractually obligated to do that at the beginning of the show. So we will do that at the beginning of the show. And we are also contractually obligated, since it is NCAA Tournament Week, to talk a little NCAA Tournament. The uh, official tournament tips off on Thursday. They do the first four in Dayton on Tuesday and Wednesday. And like, yeah, okay, it's the NCAA Tournament. Sure it is. Okay. Sure it is, sweetheart. Okay. Good job. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, they do play four games in Dayton. I, I, I got very angry about this, as I do seemingly every year uh, on Twitter.com, about the first four. Kevin... You, I know you saw it because we talked about it before. I, I have a very strong opinion that conference champions from, you know, the, the teams that are the 16 seeds that are being forced to play in Dayton, that that is absolutely outrageous. They have earned their way into the actual tournament, and it is ridiculous that they are there. It should just be limited to the crappy major conference teams that were like 500 in the ACC or 500 in the Big Ten. Those are the only teams you should have to play in Dayton to actually earn a spot in. What do you think? Well, I I agree in principle. I do because if you sit there and you win the whatever the you know Southwest Metro Atlantic Niner Conference, you should be able to go to quote unquote the real tournament. You know Thursday Friday start date, not Tuesday or Wednesday. But I will say this. If you put these major teams, these major conference teams in Dayton, are fans going to travel there? Are they going? And and I know that's such a drop in the bucket. I mean, it means everything to the city of Dayton in terms of economic impact and everything else. But if you are, I don't know, a Minnesota, and Minnesota is a bad example this year. But if you're a Minnesota, are you going to travel to Dayton on Tuesday and then up and try and follow your team to Thursday. I mean, I think that there are some issues there in terms of that. But if we're looking at this just from the sanctity and the and the pure joy and beauty of the game, there's no reason why these uh, these AQs from the small conferences need to sit there and go through this extra game. I think it's I, I think it's bad. But you know, I'll throw back to you. Just wait till wait till they screw up the tournament more and we go to 90 teams or 150 teams or whatever the hell it is they want. I mean, 313 teams. Oh, everybody gets to go to the tournament. Uh, what, what are we going to have at that point? So, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting last night watching the, um, Southeast Missouri state, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi game. I had to kind of remember it was a (laughs) mouthful there. Um, I had fun watching that game, and honestly, the 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 game the the game that kind of fits the bill of what you think that needs to be there, the Pitt Mississippi State game. I fell asleep during it, and it ended up being, ended up being a one point game. Yeah, that that they were both pretty good games last night, and I, I just to me, I don't think that I, I am not the Dayton area Chamber of Commerce, so I can't speak to this super authoritatively. I just I don't get the sense that Texas A and M Corpus Christi is bringing a ton of folks up to that from Dayton that feels like that's probably like friends and family and, you know, the parents of the players and, uh, you know, the, the three people who care super deeply, but Texas A&M Corpus Christi basketball, it feels like that's probably a lot of folks from Dayton who are going there or from around the area. I know that my son was lobbying me to maybe potentially go over there and then that didn't work out schedule wise for us, but that, that it's probably a lot of local folks and maybe University of Dayton students get tickets. I don't, I don't know exactly, but you know, maybe I guess a more compelling argument against it would be that if you have, if you eliminate some of the lower seeded teams, you're kind of sliding everyone else down the bracket a little bit and potentially getting a few more two fifteen, three fourteen kinds of upsets. Uh, Cause you, you have, the you know the sixteen teams you're kind of shaving a couple of those off the bottom of the field so everyone else sort of 
slides down a half a rung on the bracket or something like that, which I'm probably not selling Ohio State fans on. There will be more 215 upsets. I'm not sure that's going to be a real selling point for Ohio State fans or Kentucky fans recently, but yeah, that that seems like that would be the argument. I just... I was going to say, wouldn't you, if you're an A&M Corpus Christi or a Southeast Missouri State fan or whatever the games that were set for Wednesday are, wouldn't you rather go and see a, a game that should be wholly competitive versus... All right, well, maybe I can just sit there and go to Birmingham and go watch the sacrifice that's going to happen to Alabama here in this 16-1 game as they're going to sit there and, and drop the hammer on you. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think that A&M Corpus Christi sent 4,000 fans to the game or whatever, but I think, though, that I, I mean, as, as just a fan with no dog in the fight, obviously, this year, uh, I think it's. I, I think that I would be much more prone to go see that type of game than go see that sixteen-one game. And of course, you can make the argument: well, you go and you buy tickets to all the sessions, and it's a you know it's a weekend of basketball versus two games in Dayton, and and then off to whatever. But I mean, I understand your point, but I just think that it's it's a little bit more compelling. And then like, let's look at it from the television side of things. Yes, you can sit there and say, well, Pitt and Mississippi State generally are going to have much larger built-in fan bases. But I know I was much more excited about watching the first game. I didn't fall asleep during that one. Granted, it was beer-aided, but, you know, it was... Uh, I, I enjoy watching those games between the two AQ conferences, fair or unfair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those are... I think the, the, the other flip side of that coin is... And, and this is a question you kind of have to ask those players or those coaches. Would you rather get a chance to take a swing at Zach Eady and Purdue, Grady Dick and Kansas, uh, you know, number one, top seeded Alabama, whoever, would you rather have a chance to potentially be the giant killer? It feels like every year there's one of those 16 seeds. Three of them are going to lose 98 to 54, and that's fine. But one of them is going to be down three points with two minutes to go till halftime, and everyone in the nation kind of goes, eh, is it maybe, maybe? And you know, you get those games that are into the second half and the one seed's up by five with 10 minutes left and everyone's kind of looking. And would you rather have your chance to be the next UMBC and knock off top seeded Virginia? It feels like that's probably a little bit more of a memorable experience where you get a chance to go, you know, tell your grandkids, yeah, I played against Zach Eady. I played against future NBA, whatever it is on whichever one of these teams you want to talk about. You're, you know, we're talking about top. 10, you know, at least lottery kind of picks on virtually every one of these teams, you, you know, that might, that maybe that's a better story five years from now, 10 years from now. And, you know, maybe you're that, maybe you are that team that, that makes that really crazy run and gets the eyes of the nation on them on that Thursday or that Friday. So, you know, it, it's there, you can, you can see both coins. I think the actual answer is probably, uh, the NCAA and their corporate champions at CBS and the uh, Turner networks who would rather have more competitive games on Thursdays. I think that might actually be the real answer behind it. Would not be the first time that TV is sort of driving these types of decisions. But uh, yeah, that has always sort of struck me as a little bit unfair to the little guy. Can you imagine the NCAA being a little bit unfair to the little guy? First time in history. Uh, the Buckeyes are not going to be part of this NCAA tournament this this week, this year, uh, for rather obvious reasons. The, the end of the year kind of strong. And now there's some rumors going around about Chris Holtman. Chris Holtman has repeatedly stated he is 100% committed to Ohio State. But there are rumors, Kevin, that Chris Holtman might be a candidate for that Notre Dame job. Uh, Mike Bray just retired after 20-something years at Notre Dame. Your thoughts on Chris Holtman, potential candidate at Notre Dame? I, right off the bat, am not one to, to buy into when a coach says, I'm definitely not looking at a job, only to sit there and see them end up taking said job. Um, I, did, I didn't fall off the turnip truck, despite how I look or whatever. That's just not how, how, how it is. But uh, I really do not believe, uh, despite what uh, Hoops Weiss out of New York is saying, that Holtman is a candidate. I mean, maybe Notre Dame views him as a candidate, but Chris Holtman has been pretty adamant, reaffirmed with Clay Hall of, the, of ABC6 here in Columbus, that he's not looking at other jobs. Um, 
I think there would be a lot of Ohio State fans that might be happy if there was a change uh, without realizing the fact of wh- what is coming in it, with this next recruiting class on top of what we saw at the, the end of the year, uh, the uh, the growth of Roddy Gale at the end of the year, certainly the growth of Bruce Thornton at the end of the year, Felix Akpara thrust into a much more significant role with the injury and shutdown of Zed Key. I think next year could be a really great year if you sit there and um, and make a change. I mean, do you have to let guys out of their letter of intent? I mean, the, the guys that are signed and everything else, do they sit there and say, well, my coach left? I mean, what happens at that point? I think you set yourself back a significant amount if you, if you go and you do that because it just it doesn't necessarily make sense. And, and, and basketball is always going to be held to unfair – comparisons with football i mean football is competing for the cfp every year competing for the big 10 every year uh basketball for ohio state is always going to be kind of you know second place in terms of all of that so people take their football expectations lop it on to basketball and it's a difficult situation yeah and the buckeyes do have a really talented recruiting class coming in this upcoming season there's always a little bit of a okay the transfer portal just opened. Are they, are they going to keep all of these talented young guys they have on the roster this year? You would think so, probably, based on how, uh, you know, if you keep uh, if you keep uh, Chris Holtman around. But they do have a combo guard, Taysen Chapman, coming in. He is a borderline five-star. Gotti Middleton shooting uh, the small forward. Uh, Devin Royal, the power forward out of Pickerington. And then Austin Parks, the center out of uh, St. Mary's. And there are still the rumors about Bronny James sort of floating around. We'll see if that if that ends up panning out. But you know, I mean, this could be. You always you always feel like you're a little bit dumb for buying into the season end momentum kind of thing. But when you have younger guys coming in and taking on bigger roles, like you talked about with Roddy Gale, Felix Akpara, all those guys, Bruce Thornton, th- there's kind of a way you can sort of sell yourself on. Okay, maybe they sort of found something here, and if you add some of the younger guys there. You know, you you could build on that potentially for next year, but either way, next year feels like a very very big year for Chris Holtman at Ohio State. Where, you know, why would you leave if you're Chris Holtman? Well, you could have a little bit of a beat the posse uh, out of town kind of uh, thing. Where, yes, he just got a contract extension, but if they have a, if they really fall flat next year and miss the tournament again, you've got to think his seat's pretty darn warm at that point. So. You know, you, if you go to Notre Dame, you sort of reset the clock and you, you get a get a fresh start and a fresh, uh, you know, kind of like Daner Holgerson jumping from uh, West Virginia to uh, Houston uh, in football where you just, you know, maybe you're a year away from being in trouble at West Virginia. OK, you jump to Houston and you sort of reset the clock and get a fresh start there. You've seen that a, a bunch of coaches in a bunch of places. So that's that would sort of be the argument to jump for Chris Holtman. The argument against, obviously, is. You've got maybe a good, solid young core. If you keep that together, you bring in some of those talented freshmen. You could have a pretty good year. And with as big of his as his contract is, with it just having been extended, you would think they're probably more or less looking for a reason to keep him rather than a reason to get rid of him next year. So you would think, I mean, am I am I reading that wrong, Kevin? It feels like if they're, what, a 12 and 10, 12 and 8, I mean, how many games do they play in the Big Ten now? Like 20 league games, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're eleven and nine, twelve and eight next year in the Big Ten, and you're you know you're a eight seed and nine seed, that's probably enough to keep you around. And then you have a relatively young core that you could potentially bring back for another year and kind of build on that. I mean, that that sort of feels like to me the argument against him jumping to and to Notre Dame. This was always going to be a weird year because. They lost the entire team from the year before. And when you sit there and you have a team that's made up largely of transfers, you know, one year rentals, and you just don't know necessarily what you're going to get. I mean, there were ups, up, up, ups and downs with all of the guys with Ice Likely. I mean, he was great. And then he had his family emergency and kind of, uh, he was gone from the team for a couple few games and then came back and really never found his stroke again. Tanner Holden never really found footing whatsoever. And then Sean McNeil would get hot at the, at, at good times. But so you're dealing with, you're dealing with a lot of unknowns there. I think next year you have your core group of freshmen with or without Bryce Sensabaugh, probably without, but you know, and then you bring in another group of freshmen. You're going to be a very young team 
But I think that you're going to see a situation of where these are all going to be guys that you know that you're going to be riding with and nothing with the portal or with the NBA or anything else is forever. But it is much more of a homegrown team than it is a team that's kind of just pieced together. But I did find it interesting. I don't remember whose article it was. I do know it was in The Athletic. I had talked to. I, I think it was to, to Chris and that I guess Chris Holtman and Gene Smith did have a meeting and Gene's like, play the kids, play the freshmen. And we certainly saw some changes once that happened. I know a lot of people felt that uh, Roddy Gale was not getting enough playing time earlier in the year and we saw what he was capable of. And he was, I mean, he was red hot during the uh, the Big Ten tournament. And what's our conversation like? If Ohio State wins two more games in the big tournament and comes in, we're probably we're probably talking about Ohio State and Dayton is what we're doing. But you know, it's uh, thing you know things would be very different. But I'm I'm sure that the 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 Chris Holtman detractors would still be like, yeah, but why didn't this team do it earlier and 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 win the Big Ten and and do this and do that? But uh, there's there's really no reason to move him on. Uh, it's it's tough to be the guy after the guy, and Thad Mata proved to be the guy. Get, I mean, they never won a national championship, but they played in the championship game. They they got you know they've made deep runs in the tournament, and it's it's gonna it was difficult. But the thing that Chris Holtman hasn't had is one AAU team uh, out of you know the Ohio Indiana area sit there and provide him with with Greg Oden and Mike Conley Jr. and Daquan Cook and guys like that. I mean, there's it's certainly. Uh, it, it, while saying it wasn't hand delivered to to Thad Mod, it's like here, here you go. I mean, he had to go out there and recruit his ass off to to be able to get those guys. Uh, let's let's see what happens after this class, and let's see if this is this is the class, or if it you know hopefully doesn't end up turning into one of the other you know Thad Mod part part two, the Thad Five part two, which completely blew up and kind of probably put this program on a downward trajectory. Yeah, that that second Thad Five with uh, Mickey Mitchell and uh, Austin Grandstaff and all those guys, that one definitely did not work out at all. If you can keep these guys together, and that's a little bit more of a challenge now than it was in Thad Mata's day with the transfer portal and NIL and all that kind of stuff. If you can keep this core together, that probably puts set you up for a pretty decent season next year. But you got to get through the offseason. There were a lot of that was almost an entire turnover of the Ohio State basketball team between last season and this season. So I feel like you're almost going to know, have a decent sense for how this season, this upcoming season might go in about June or so when you see who's still here, who's coming in, who is left, if anyone. And where does, you know, where does that roster stand then? Because you don't want to do another year when you, uh, you know, the the equivalent of uh, keeping one card on in uh, poker and turning the other four in and, and, you know, at that point, like, no, just just go ahead and throw your cards in at that point, because you kind of know how that's going to go unless you get uh, unless you get real, real lucky. That was kind of what they did in basketball last year. You don't want to do that again. So we uh, put out a, a uh, an ask for questions and got a few sort of tangentially related to, uh, you know, anything. Uh, on Twitter, so we'll get to those in a minute. But I had one first. Tony Woodbrand, this one is from Langdon Alger. I will just tell you, I saw it on Twitter, and I thought, oh, that's a fun question. Kevin Noon, do you think you could throw for 10-plus passing yards in an NFL game? I get I get the, the run of a whole game to try and do this. You have you have the run of a whole game, yes, and uh, considering how many turnovers you're going to have, uh, you're probably going to have the opponent with a short field, and they're probably going to score relatively quickly. So you might get more possessions than a typical NFL game. Do I have Do I have some say on some of the plays? Because I'm going for that Urban Meyer little pup pass type situation where it's not a handoff; it's a pass. So those are passing yards on like jet sweeps. You give me you give me that, and you give me like a Paris Campbell or somebody like that in terms of speed. Um, probably still only going to get to about six or seven. I don't know. I I think that there are ways to kind of massage the question to maybe get there and get the yards through some of the flaws and how and how yard uh, stats are really kept in the NFL, but. If you're saying no, you have to sit there and do real passing, not uh, not Dr. Pepper, can toss, underhands, and things like that. Not a chance. 
Yeah, this is one of these things where having been on the field just for high level college football, I don't think people really have an appreciation for exactly how big and how fast everyone is moving and the amount of time, how difficult it is to see from field level. I'm 6'2", so I I have a decent chance to see over the offensive line and the defensive line. I can tell you, there's just a whole just it is just the old, you know, the old old timey maps where it's just here be monsters. That is everything behind the offensive line and defensive line. Even looking through, it's just any pass completed, you know, a drag route or something like that. It's like, I don't know. We'll see who comes out the other side of the offensive line because it's very difficult to see because there are very large human beings moving very fast and trying to keep you from seeing well. So, And I think the other thing that might be difficult is if the opponent, Kevin, knows that you're going to be doing the pop pass, and I don't think they're going to feel like they need to keep a safety deep, right? I don't think they're going to need to respect your arm going downfield, throwing a 15 yard out, anything like that. I feel like you're playing, you're playing a lot of guys in the box there and that might limit your ability to, uh, to even make the pop pass. pass you got to get it on the first play. I mean, you got to seriously got to get it on the first play. I mean, first of all, if any of us doughy pasty guys get out there, you're not going to have a deep safety or anything like that. So it's going to be, it's going to be 10 men, 11 men in the box to begin with. Um, n- none of us are just look like we are, are winning the church rec league right now with, uh, with our <laughs> arm. Um, yeah, it, it would be, it would be difficult. You'd have to hit them on the first play. And then Lord knows I would probably take a knee. If I got to the 10 yards, I take a knee the rest of the way. So I wouldn't give up any yards, have any <laughs> negative passing yards, because that would be my luck. I would get 10 on the first one. I would try it two more times because of course I'm a, you know, greedy, egocentric jerk like that. And I would lose all 10 yards at that point, And then I would be sitting at zero. So I guess the question then, Kevin, is if the four major American professional sports, you have to make a basket in an NBA game, you have to hit a pitch from in fair territory off of a major league baseball pitcher, you have to 10 yards passing in a NFL game or score goal in an NHL game, which is the easiest to you? None of them are easy. Which one is the one that you think you might have the most realistic chance, no matter what, you know, sub 1% chance or whatever, which one is the most likely to happen to you and which one is the no chance in a million years? Well, I'm going to just sit there and say that no chance is probably hockey, but honestly, I should also probably be basketball because I would get my blankety blank swatted immediately in the NBA. But, uh, the last time I did anything hockey related was probably 35 years ago and was floor hockey. And, um, I wasn't out there necessarily for my shot. I was out there just because I like to hit people. Um, so I don't have any form whatsoever with, uh, uh, with, with, with a hockey stick. Um, so that leaves me baseball and football for the other categories. We've already talked about the challenges with football, with baseball. You know, you sit there and I'm going against even a mid, you know, even a middle of the road pitcher. I mean, still, oh, darn, his fastball is 91. I, you know, I haven't seen that. And then, then, then you throw in breaking balls and everything else. And I'm just going to sit there and just have a little yellow stream going down my leg at that point. So um, I think just the element of surprise of football is I'm going to say football would be like the most likely still unlikely scenario because um, that just that element of surprise of maybe being able to do a little hinky something right off the top. There's there's no way to. To, 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 to goose the situation in, in, uh, in baseball, unless you're going to saying that I'm going to go against Zach Greinke and he's going to throw me EFAS pitches every single time. And even with that, I, I mean, even with that, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hit a Greinke EFAS pitch. Yeah. If you're getting an EFAS pitch, okay. That's basically a slow pitch softball. So, okay. You could, you could talk me into that. You might just, you might be able to throw the bat out there and get it on something on a, a major league baseball pitch. I don't, you know. I don't think I'm even shooting a parachute over shortstop or anything like that, but you maybe could do that. And I think basketball, maybe if they're not guarding you, you you get the ball in a spot where you know, no one's expecting you to shoot and you can just kind of chuck one up. 
without a defender on you, you know, from half court or something like that, maybe you could do that, but you would have to get lucky. And as soon as they figure out that's what you're doing, that stops. And as soon as the uh, baseball pitcher deser- de- determines, you know, yeah, that's not going to we're <laughs> you're getting you're getting nothing but curveballs now. Like, good luck. Well, we're all counting on you. Yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think there's a real high likelihood of any of those happening. Basketball and baseball, maybe. Uh, and, you know, I have played hockey before I coach hockey. I have spent a lot of time on hockey skates the last uh, four years or so. Let me tell you, no chance. None. None at all. Unless unless I'm standing in front of the goal and the slap shot from the point happens to deflect off of me while I'm facing the wrong way and it banks in off my butt and I get a cheapy. No chance. None whatsoever. And the defenseman is probably driving me through the ice at that point in front of the goal anyway. So probably not. So, all right. So that thought that was, I thought that was a fun question and uh, just a good, 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 good way to sort of think through things and, and sort of make you appreciate a little bit exactly how impressive the stuff that you see on TV really is. Uh, we got a couple other questions. These are all probably relatively short ones. First one from our good buddy, Jordan Kapler. Yeah, I got a question. Why is Kevin the way that he is? Kevin, what is the way that you are? And why? I mean, I I just have so many adjectives I could use. I mean, just awesome, you know, magnanimous, humble. I mean, all of these things. I mean, I just say it would be, you know, just a great upbringing, just some great DNA. I mean, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I just, I mean, I'm embarrassed to just, you know, to go on and on about myself. But, you know, Jordan... Thanks for watching. <laughs> we do appreciate you guys watching. We may try and do a live show later on this week. We'll see if we can make schedules work. Uh, but keep an eye out for that. Maybe Thursday morning before the tournament starts. We'll see if we can make that work. Uh, but uh, yeah, keep an eye on that at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. Make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel so that you get a notification if and when we do that kind of thing. Uh, we'll either do it this week or we'll do it next week at some point. So make sure you are subscribed there. Uh, next one. This is, uh, if you have ever watched our shows on YouTube, you know that Kevin lives, it looks like, inside a pet store. There are always cats and dogs running around and fighting and arguing and barking and all of that. So, question from Dave Rowland. My question for Kevin is, quote, what is the best way to launch a cat? Well, since I do like cats, and I mean, it's just to get them out of the shot and to stop fighting. You need to sit there and you need to get pick them up from under and then just... It's just a push out, and then they land on their feet. It's it's not an over an overhand type of throw. It's not a sidearm type of throw. It's just here. I am helping you out of the room. I am helping you out of the room. Stop tearing up my leg. Stop ruining the show. And when you do that, that works pretty well. Uh, I had the wherewithal before we started recording the show to close the door, so both of the cats are out. As people know, I have a new puppy, and I told my wife, oh, it, I will only be 15 minutes, and it has been much longer, so I am sure that I will walk downstairs to puddles of pee-pee. That's uh, one of the joys of a new dog, uh, or a new cat, or whatever. Yes, that is always always fun. I was slightly concerned we were going to hear the uh, invention of the cat trebuchet or something in that uh, in the answer to that question, so I'm glad glad we didn't, glad we kept it, uh, kept it uh, PG. Uh, last one, and this is from Greg J, who has one of my favorite Twitter handles at Potato Shirts. Uh, have you ever selected an audiobook solely based on the narrator? Um, no, and I'm new to the audiobook game. I just finally got Audible and Audible. If you'd like to sponsor any of our great shows, please contact us. Uh, I just finally got around to Audible, and I'm finishing up book number one. Um, I did get uh, a book by Richard Blade, the uh, the DJ uh, from Caro Q out in Los Angeles. He's on Sirius XM, and he, I mean, the vast majority of it is about my favorite band, Depeche Mode, and I. it's my understanding that he narrates it. So I'm looking forward to listening to that one once I am done listening to my Tom Clancy book. But even if if Richard Blade was not narrating the this audio book, I would have still gotten it but uh i think there are some books out there that i would probably be on the fence for but if if it was a really good narrator i would i would definitely have to to go in i mean i'm starting to get backlog with credits now on audible anyway so i'm going to need to pick some books here in the future so 
maybe in the comments any ideas of what books that I need to read next. I will not be doing a book report, but I will tell people what I choose in a later show. Yeah, and I am more of a podcast person than a books on tape kind of person. Oh, wow, really dated myself there. Audiobook person, not just books on tape. We're not just we're not solely living in 2003 anymore, friends. Uh, a more of a podcast person than an audiobook person. Uh, but, you know, I, I am not above a, you know, oh, Morgan Freeman narrates this. Well, that, this will be a soothing, uh, a soothing read. I also like when the uh, the author reads the book himself and sometimes him or herself. Uh, Michael Lewis, I, I really enjoy Michael Lewis reading Michael Lewis books. Uh, you know, if you read the, you know, the big short or um, Flash Boys or, uh, you know, any of any of those Michael Lewis books, he's got a new one. He was uh, with uh, Sam Bankman Freed uh, working on a book on Sam Bankman Freed right before Sam Bankman Freed got even more no newsworthy recently. Uh, so uh, that should be a humdinger of a book. Uh, I like the Michael Lewis podcast uh, against the rules. But uh, he also is uh, doing he's doing a sort of series of background stories on those uh, on, you know, background research uh, on the Sam Bankman Freed book and doing podcasts on those right now. That's a pretty good listen as well. You can find that on the uh, Against the Rules uh, podcast feed. But I like I like him reading his book. I was also listening to Dan Carlin talking about uh, on one of his shows recently talking about the fact that he's the host of Hardcore History, if you don't know that name. Uh, but he does a whole separate feed called something, I don't know, search Dan Carlin, you'll find it. Uh, and he did a whole show recently where he was talking to um, uh, music producer uh, Rick Rubin, Rick Rubin, I think, uh, talking about, you know, how difficult it was for him to read his book, his audiobook. Because the way he does his podcast is it's sort of unscripted. He has sort of notes in an outline, and then he just kind of rambles off of that. He said reading his book. And doing, you know, trying to do the audiobook for his book was like one of the most difficult things he's ever done. Like that's really challenging for some reason because you you write one way and you talk a different way, and in TV you learn to write conversationally. That's very different than writing for a newspaper or something like that, or writing for a website. So, yeah, it, it is uh, that that is a very interesting topic, uh, audiobooks and and who's reading them and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I do. I do find you know certain certain authors. I do enjoy their stuff. You know, Michael Lewis. I like Michael Lewis stuff just because it's Michael Lewis stuff. But uh, his his audiobooks are uh, particularly good as well. So, all right. So that will do it for us for today. Tony will be back in a little while. We may have uh, another one more show with uh, with no Tony. Uh, and again, keep an eye on the uh, YouTube feed, youtubecom slash huddle or just follow us on Twitter. We'll tweet it out if we uh, end up doing a live show at some point during the next day or two. Uh, before the weekend, it'll either be uh, Thursday, it'll probably be Thursday or next week. And then uh, the Buckeyes football team back in action next Tuesday. We'll be back at the Woody Hayes for practice number three of the spring. And then some interviews. I think we're talking to Ryan Day next Tuesday. And uh, then should be a full week next week as we head into uh, what will be a very busy and uh, very busy spring pro day next Wednesday, another practice next Thursday, a scrimmage on Saturday. It is going to be a very, very busy and eventful week uh, for the Buckeyes. And, of course, at BuckeyeHuddle.com, we'll have lots of coverage of all of that great stuff. Plus, of course, lots of recruiting visits, lots of storylines to follow with Spring Ball, with Pro Day, all of that stuff, all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So make sure you check that all out today. That will do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Thank you for Kevin for, to Kevin for joining me. And we'll talk to you next time.